So I was reading part of a, an article from Evan Grant, and it was illuminating. And we talked with Davis Wenzel about this kind of earlier today as well. We'll see if we roll that out today. Is Nate Lowe has gone into several of these spring trainings with the Rangers with a singular focus. Okay. As I'm sure you can guess, last year it was, hey, Let's work on that defense. And it is it is amazing to see how he went from I I, I don't struggling mean, at times. Yes. I was gonna say one of the least best. Let's go with that. Yeah. Fielding first baseman to legitimately a gold glove. So you saw that effort. And that's what I think is really interesting is that was his focus all spring long. And then the year before that, there was a lot of focus on turn the ball opposite field a little bit more or popping a little bit more power. And you saw that reflect in the numbers two years ago. And then clearly there's been more of a dip. And the reason why I was fascinated by this is something that Bruce Bochy said is 2022, Nate Lowe, that's his focus in spring training, wins the Silver Slugger. This last year, his focus is, I got to improve my defense, wins gold glove. Bruce Bochy was asked, oh, what do you think his focus is for this spring training? And he goes, oh, I don't know, probably to win them both at the same time. And so I, I was fascinated by that because I feel like we're all okay with Nate Lowe, right? Like you're okay yep. to maybe really good with Nate Lowe. But you see flashes all the time and think, holy cow, this player could be really, really good. But then when the defense went up, the offense ebbed and his OPS dropped. And how do you strike the right balance in a what's feeling like it could potentially be a loaded lineup all over again? How do you make Nate Lowe a bigger part of that lineup? Well, I think one thing that when you're healthy, this team... It doesn't need a great hitting first baseman. Okay. You're you're kind of lucky in sure. that, right? Because a lot of times you're not going to have as good of a hitter at second base that the Rangers have or shortstop or catcher. So you can kind of cover up a little bit at times if your first baseman isn't the prototypical 30 home runs, 100 RBI uh, type of player that you kind of expect. When you think of a first baseman, that's kind of what you think of, about 30 or more home runs and sure. 100 RBI type of guy. I think Nate Lowe can do that this year. Uh, 30 might be a little much, but I think he can. The one thing that I don't know, and this does come to the personal stuff, is last year, and I'm sorry, I don't know the follow-up on this, but his mom had cancer. I don't yeah, know. some people were just asking about that. I had to admit I hadn't yeah, checked that out either. I haven't followed up to ask a Rangers yeah. organizational person, like, how is, how is Nate Lowe's mother doing? Because that had to weigh on him a lot during sure. the season Absolutely. that his mom – couldn't come when they played in the playoffs versus Tampa. I don't believe his mother was able to come to that. Uh, it ended up being a two-game series, yeah. but she wasn't healthy enough. And just think about that as a parent. If you have a, a couple boys and they like a sport, can you imagine if both of them were in the playoffs against each other, but you physically couldn't go watch that, it's that situation? It's and so he was dealing with a lot last year off of the field with the health of his mother. So... I don't know where she's at right now, but uh, I'm asking. I'm asking around right now, so yeah, but, I'll try and find out. There. But hopefully, he's you know, you know, the off the field stuff is is getting better and better, and he can be a guy who, in a way, you can kind of protect if Evan Carter is the guy who I think he's going to be. If because he wasn't on the team mostly, sure. For, so now you add a dude who might be a 300 batting average guy, a 375 on base percentage, and like a 900 OPS. Like all of a sudden, you add that, it kind of helps you a little bit more in your situation. What will Wyatt Lankford be? How much will he be on the team? But yeah, Nate Lowe has to be a better hitter. We went over it for some reason. It was weird. A lot of first base numbers were down last year amongst uh, major league first basemen. One one thing I did want to throw out there that I think I personally just take for granted is Nate Lowe is always available. He, he, yep. In the three years he's yeah. been here, I believe he's missed a total of 11 games. And I'm not saying he missed them because he wasn't capable of playing. They're probably just like, hey, why don't you just have a seat for the day? But 11 games in three years. And, Corey, you have three more years mm -hmm. that he's not a free agent. Wow. So 24, 25, and 26, you have control of him. He's not a – so – you know he's gonna this year he makes four million dollars, which is up. Great. but that's still a pretty sure. cheap 
a cheap contract for a guy who's won a silver slugger and a gold glove. You know, when he arrived, he and this is this kind of goes to the proof of how far this team's come with Chris Young at the helm too. But when he arrived, he was your best hitter. Like, and you were like, "Oh man, is this guy like? Did he find something?" And then they stack better hitters around him, and he's yes. like, "Okay, he's part of this group of of really ta- good talent." And that's what Chris Young keeps doing. He's like, "Hold on, is my talent good enough? No, let's go find somebody better, and let's keep doing this." But you know, I think obviously how how you are in a clubhouse matters a lot, and if you can, if this clubhouse is seems to be very consistent, very steady. Uh, but you know his defensive presence, Kevin, definitely is a huge factor. As a left-handed bat, you hope to you know alternate some guys and and protect some guys, and that's a factor of whether or not he can protect. And that's where he will be in the lineup based on how well he's protecting the guys in front of him. So can Nate Lowe find the balance of having more power without sacrificing plate discipline? Because I I realize those things can clearly go hand in hand. But if you just look at it, like the year he hit 27 home runs, there's a drastic drop in the amount of walks. Whereas the two years kind of sandwiched around it where he was like, I don't know, 17, 18 home runs is he has a significantly higher number of walks. Last year, he was seventh among all MLB qualifiers with 93 walks. So he's shown good plate discipline. Can you find a way for him specifically to merge that level of plate discipline with having some more power? Because I know a lot of times people think of power as more like reckless or free swingers. I don't think that always has to be the case, though. Well, so he's going to get strikes. Uh, He doesn't really – you want plate discipline from all of your hitters. The more good pitches you swing at from a hitter's standpoint, the better chance you have of being successful. But if you look at it and you're pitching against the Texas Rangers, all right, who are you looking for in the lineup? If I'm going to pitch around a guy to get to a guy, Nate Lowe's going to be at best fifth on your list of threats in the Rangers lineup. So when he comes up, most likely the pitcher is going to say – I don't want to give him a free pass because the next guy coming up might be a better hitter or I already have a couple guys on base and I have those guys on base because I wanted to get Nate Lowe in this situation because this is the guy I believe I have the best chance of getting out. So, yes, you want the discipline, but yet I think like a guy like I talked to Mark McLemore obviously a lot over, you know, the last years is he said it was so awesome batting second in the Rangers lineup because behind him was Pudge Rodriguez and Juan Gonzalez. He's getting fastballs. He's like, it's work. A, when you have people like that behind you in your lineup, or if you're hitting right after those guys, now they're like, I have to get him. Like you say, it's Rusty Greer. I have to go after Rusty Greer. I've already allowed Pudge and Juan to, to be on base for free or to just get singles. I need to get this guy out because I can't put another guy on base so those guys can really benefit. And can you just imagine if the outcome of that was 2022 offensive Nate Lowe to go along with last year's defensive presence? I I, I hear what you're saying. You you don't have to have that to succeed, but as long as we're at it, why not get greedy, Corey? 2022, you pointed out the 27 home runs. That's an outlier for him. For sure. The 302 is an outlier as well. And that's that's the number that matters. I know OPS is huge and everything, but 302 compared to 262, 30 percent of the time you're on base yeah. and you're creating a problem for somebody. More likely driving in runs, and that's where like you you feel like the guys Mike in front of him. The, let's say the four guys in front. Of him, let's say he's hitting five. I'm not sure where he's going to stay throughout the season, but let's say he's hitting five. Those four guys in front of him, you have pretty good confidence that they're going to be on base yes, or yeah. or be in a position to produce runs. And that's where I just want I want line drive gaps. I just want shots. I don't need home runs as much as I just definitely need a dude that is consistently on base, putting them in the gaps, driving in runs at that in that spot. And he's a guy that obviously his weakness is fastballs inside. You know, he he's a guy that. I don't want to say he has slow bat speed, but you see a lot of his hits going to opposite field. I remember the big homer he hit against Houston. I believe it was game five. It was an opposite field home run. He, Can we back up just just really yeah. quick? Some baseball 101, because we like to help people out along the way. You might just be able to like picture it in your head, but not always. But a lot of times you go opposite field because you were a little bit more behind the pitch than you might or have Or the been ball was otherwise. thrown away, so you have to kind of go with the where the pitch is. So... 
what you want to teach, a, a great hitter is able to hit the ball where it's pitched. You know, the, the one that reminds me, I know I'm going way back when, is Tony Gwynn. He would show, this is the contact, this is the point of contact you want to make on an outside pitch. This is the point of contact you want to make on a pitch down the middle. This is the point of contact you want to make on a pitch in. And if you're making those points of contact, then you're going to hit the ball hard to all sides of the field. But when that ball gets in on Nate, he struggles. The thing that he does a good job of is he fouls it off into, let's say, the third base dugout or the third base uh, stands. Until and he, he lives pitch, for another yeah. pitch. And it's, it's interesting because pitchers will just not believe on throwing that same pitch over and over and over again. They eventually go to a slider or an off-speed pitch. And if they don't locate it well, now Nate Lowe's bat head gets out in front and he pulls it. I know the segment's coming to an end. I wanted to look this up just to make sure. One of the Rangers' premium prospects is... Uh, Abby Ortiz. I'm shortening his first name because everybody tells me he just goes by that. In A ball last year, he's their biggest first base prospect. He had 33 home runs, 101 RBIs, and 109 games, batted 294 wow. with a 990 OPS. He's not ready for the major sure. leagues. This year, he'll start off in Frisco, but. He has three years left, Nate Lowe, but there is a prospect that the Rangers believe maybe in 2025 could possibly be that big power hitting first baseman. And that might be potentially another asset that you're like, hey, either we have amazing depth or maybe we can move this and try to improve other shortcomings yeah. in the team.